What if I told you that last weekend in Seattle, over 17,000 people crowded into the key arena to watch teams battle out for a $18 million purse? I would say no way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> what if I told you that the winning team took home $6.6 .6 million for playing competitive video games? What if I told you I was wearing the t-shirt of the winning team that won the International Five, Evil Geniuses? That's how big, that's how big esports are becoming as a part of culture, not only here in the United States, but all over the world. It is starting to eclipse uh, some very popular sports that you may know, like hockey, baseball, basketball. Uh, what we've got going on up here is examples of live video game, live esports events happening. One of them is an esport event, one of them is an actual sporting event. So as I move through this, I want to just show that the passion and enthusiasm and excitement that we traditionally associate with uh, traditional sports, we're actually seeing in droves in the esports community. Uh, this is an example of a Staples Center where there is a basketball game going on, and this is an example of the Staples Center where the League of Legends Championship is occurring in 2014. So just how big is eSports? Well, in 2017, it's expected to be a billion-dollar business. It's just almost there this year. And by 2020, they expect it to triple to be a $3 million business. Just to give you an example of how many of these are happening around the globe, um, and how big the prize money is starting to grow for the actual talent that, uh, that plays the, the games. Viewership, here's an interesting one. The League of Legends Championship had 32 million worldwide viewers, and it gives you some pretty nice comparable stats to other, video, uh, other sporting events and other pop culture television events, just to give you an idea of size and scale. I think I can leave this, these slides for the people, right? I see some folks taking pictures. I'll, I'll be happy to post this post-event so if you don't have to go through because I know we're on a time crunch and I'm going to be spending a lot of data. So what is eSports? eSports is competitive video gaming that um, has a prize pool. It's organized. It has rules, competitive. Um, how is it done? Well, people organize these events, and then they need a place to broadcast it, which is where Twitch comes in, the largest platform for eSports broadcasts in the world. And then we ask people, why do they watch? Well, it's the same reasons that people watch traditional sports. There's competitiveness. There's aspirational elements of, I want to be that good someday. I have a favorite team. I like to root for my favorite team with my, with my friends. Right? Literally, a lot of the things that you can associate with traditional sports happen in eSports. It's been around for a long time. That's the thing that's important for everybody to know. Competitive video gaming actually goes all the way back to the pinball days when local pinball halls would have competitions for cash. If you think about it, um, then with the advent of the arcade, they started having, you know, uh, arcade-based uh, for prizes. Once we got into uh, 2000s, we had the internet. We had the LAN, what we call LAN parties, where they sort of the, the, the birthplace of traditional esports as we see it now, where people would actually bring their computers in, connect them all, and play competitive games, first-person shooters in most cases. So if you think, see things like Counter-Strike, that's why I see that. And then... Developers started actually making games specifically for the competitive environment, and at the same time, an online streaming service called Twitch started broadcasting this. So it's been around just much like poker had been around for hundreds or you know hundred years, but it wasn't until the advent of the pocket cam, where people who weren't at the event or who weren't playing could actually enjoy the experience. As far as growth goes, it is a global phenomenon. It's very important for people to understand that. Esports, both from a competitive perspective and a viewership perspective, is worldwide. So some of the numbers that we're going to see here are pretty impressive, but that is because they're touching people all across the globe. People oftentimes want to know, what's the NBA or the NFL or which is baseball in esports? It's a little bit more complicated than that. So esports are played based on a particular game. So people compete at a particular game. Um, in the cat case, it would be Dota 2, League of Legends, StarCraft, a whole lot of different games. The way that esports are organized is in sort of four different tiers, I would say. The first is going to be publisher and developer-driven uh, esports leagues. So Steve and, and the folks from ArenaNet and Guild Wars 2 uh, would be the folks that develop, do, do, do League of Legends, the International, Blizzard. They actually organize or co-produce the leagues themselves and run the tournaments. 
We also have a lot of independent leagues. So people that actually put on esports, and these numbers are big, where they actually don't own the IP, but the IP owners let them use their game to competitive. This would be things like uh, DreamHack, Intel Extreme Masters, ESL are all examples of these. We also have a lot of grassroots and small gaming um, esports programs that are all basically online only. So this is where there's no physical activation, people are actually just competing online. And then you actually have the teams and the players th themselves streaming. So imagine the idea that you could actually watch uh, Kobe Bryant or LeBron James or um, you know, any professional athlete actually practice their craft on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So that's the actual team players and streams. And all of those are broadcast on Twitch. So that's, for, for us, uh, this community and understanding this community and, and really nurturing it is something that's very near and dear to us because it's actually how Twitch got its formation. Uh, just to give you an idea of size and scale on Twitch, and again, all these numbers I'll make available to you so you don't need to take notes. Um, over 89 million spectators worldwide last year on esports. What I love is over 11 billion minutes were consumed watching esports on Twitch last year. So how do brands get involved? And I think after I throw this out there, if you're not familiar with it and you're not familiar with how it's organized, I think how do I engage this? Because obviously there is an incredibly passionate, incredibly active community, but how do I get involved? It's actually simpler than you think. So when we talk about branding opportunities in esports, I'm gonna talk about four different ways. And this is gonna sound kind of ridiculous, but you could just run commercials. <laughs> you can just run targeted media that focuses on esports. Um, and, and just like mo most companies when they're tra targeting traditional sports, they're gonna buy ads, right? It's an ad buy. But you can actually focus your media all the way down to the game level, so if you wanna focus it on a specific game or a specific geo territory, you can do that. Even though the events are happening worldwide, you could say, I want the US viewers of a Dota 2 game that's being played in Cologne, Germany. Okay? Or you could take sort of the ESPN approach, which says, hey, I want to get the sports demographic folks, so I'm, I'm going to buy ESPN across a variety of their channels, so why don't I just focus my spend on esports in general, so I can just be a part of that community, so that when people are interacting on any esports side of things, they're being touched there. Second is actually integrating into the actual uh, events themselves. So this is no different than the Capital One Bowl Week. Right? I'm going to throw out some, if you guys are traditional sports guys, uh, AT&T at the half, right? where the brands are actually built into the broadcasts themselves. All of these events, and I gave you some uh, examples of them, the Capcom Pro Tour, Heroes of the Storm, Halo Championship Series, all have branded opportunities. These are things like where there's static placement in the actual broadcast, audio callouts, the player's de uh, the desk where the uh, shoutcasters are calling from. It could be much like the um, Dr. Pepper halftime you know, throw the football, get the million dollars. All of those things are available because these are m events that are being watched by millions of people all over the world. If you are interested in a physical activation, a lot of these actually have physical opportunities on site. So some of the biggest ones, I just mentioned the Key Arena last, uh, last two weekends ago was sold out with 17,000 people. Uh, this coming weekend, Madison Square Garden is sold out for the League of Legends North American Championship, so 20,000 people will be in Madison Square Garden watching the North American League of Legends Championships. So physical, on-site activations, your ability to touch people, have them give away things, be there to write the check, for example, uh, of the winning team. One of the things that we're seeing, and this is interesting because you don't see this in traditional sports because it's very difficult to put on quote-unquote exhibitions in traditional sports, but because these are uh, significantly online, we were actually doing an, an awful lot of custom esports tournaments where the brand actually sponsors the tournament itself. Um, so this was an example of some films that have done it in the past. Uh, the, the John Wick CSGO finals. John Wick was a Keanu Reeves action adventure or action movie. Um, so they sponsored a, a game that was about first person shooters. So again, uh, tying the brand specifically to the game and the demographic. Um, we had a great example of this one here, and I, know, I think I'm on time, still pretty good. Um, where Duracell had a 26 hour battery rechargeable battery. So they did a 26 hour Madden marathon where pro players and pro NFL players and competitive Madden folks actually played in a 26 hour uh, consecutive hour tournament to feature the brand of the Duracell. So again, lots of different ways that brands can engage here. And then interestingly enough, 
these teams are sponsorable. So I mentioned Evil Geniuses here, I'm wearing their t-shirt, but all of these guys that compete with the teams are actually sponsorable, much, much like uh, a NASCAR team would be. Or if you look at this, the jerseys in uh, soccer, they have a brand sponsor on them. Um, these are things where you're getting your logo, you're being a part of any of their streams on and off the brand, you might be on their jerseys. Uh, so I just wanted to take a minute to show you the overarching what is eSports. We're gonna talk a little bit more about it. Um, as well as let you know that I've never been a part of something, I've been, uh, mentioned I've been in video games a long time, about 17 years, where so many brands are so interested in getting involved in esports. I really feel like everybody is standing around the pool, and a bunch of people are dipping their toes in. But pretty soon, somebody's gonna do a cannonball, and everybody's gonna be, in, everybody's jumping in. And so that's the, the momentum that we're seeing with, with esports um, and, and what's happening on Twitch and with our publishing partners. Great, thanks Andy. So up next is uh, Steve Fowler to give us that brand publisher perspective on esports. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I represent kind of the other side. We're a developer and publisher up in Seattle area, ArenaNet. We make a game called Guild Wars 2. And um, I'll talk about why our esports is a little different than some of these mega esports uh, groups and, and, and developers that uh, Andy was talking about. But first, I want to show you a, a highlight clip, if we have that video ready, of uh, one of our recent World Tournament Series uh, that we did in Boston for PAX East, if you could run that. They have to climb a huge mountain here in these last two minutes to take this away from them. We've got the decap, no kills coming across the board. This is so close. Eight point very, game very at the moment. They don't oh get my the last god! Oh, they don't oh, get it! Go. Come on, boys! That is gonna be it. Your World Tournament Series champions, it is Orange Logo! I want to thank every one of you for attending and every one of you watching at home. Good night. That guy, Rom, jumped out of his chair before the game was even over, cheering on his other four team members as they were about to head to victory and, and be uh, first place in the event. And it's not just those guys. It's the thousands and thousands of people that are watching on Twitch as we're streaming this. And why does it mean so much to us as a game developer and publisher? Well, there's, there's kind of two main reasons I'll touch on, and I'll keep this short so we can do a little Q&A. Um, number one, let me tell you a little bit about Guild Wars 2. We're not League of Legends or Dota or Smite or some of these other big competitive only games. We're a big MMORPG, like a World of Warcraft. And so people that play our game don't just compete. There are plenty of pl uh, players in our game that stand around our capital city and role play with each other or go in dungeons and kill dragons. But there's also a lot of people that really like to fight other real people and they we give them a, uh, a game mode uh, called PvP. Uh, structured PvP in our game, and it's a completely balanced, very fair, uh, high-stakes, uh, fast-paced action game, if you will. What we found for Guild Wars 2 is, um, in order for us to be successful, we want to maximize playtime. So we're an always-on game. It's an online world. And the more people play, the more people pay. And so we need to have reasons why people can log in every day. And so we do lots of things on those other game gameplay modes, like we provide episodic story content that we put out every month, and we do new dungeons, and we do expansion packs like this one that's coming out uh, pretty soon this year. But those are all very um, uh, resource-required, uh, 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 development uh, team-required uh, pieces of content, where something like this is completely sustained by the community. And so what we can do is we can, we can really hit on two things for us. Number one, we can increase playtime, um, which directly translates to, to dollars for us. So as an example, uh, people that play our game in general, the average uh, player of Guild Wars 2, plays about 722 minutes a week, which is pretty impressive, right? They, they log in a lot of time in the game. But if somebody incorporates PvP into their playtime in Guild Wars 2, that jumps to 840 minutes a week. And so it's really important for us to give lots of things to do in the game 
uh, and to have PvP be something that can be self-sustaining. I don't have to have developers that are cranking out new episodes of PvP. It's players like this that are fighting each other. They're creating the drama, which leads me to that second big point. So from a marketing perspective, it's g content generation, right? These guys are the celebrities of our community. Um, and it is human drama. It is, this is basically reality TV for gamers. Um, it is live sports. It is all of that. But um, one thing that I'll end on here before we go into, into um, uh, the discussion is the, the, the in, most interesting thing that I think came out of uh, our latest World Tournament Series. So that was, a, that was a highlight from Boston, I think, in March. We just got back from Cologne where we did another World Tournament Series. And uh, we had four of our best teams in the whole world, one from China, two from Europe, one from North America. They battled out. It was, it was completely insane and intense and was awesome. Uh, but the stories that emerged after that were really the things that sustained the community involvement. And it was, it was about personalities. So the, one of our teams uh, out of Europe that's one of the best teams in the world is called uh, the Civilized Gentleman. And I'll tell you a little story about their, their leader. Uh, their leader is a guy by the name of the Lord Helseth. And the Lord Helseth is quite full of himself, um, and went on Twitch uh, the day before the event and proclaimed that they were already victors, and that it didn't matter who was playing uh, in the tournament, it was just going to be him watching at his own leisure who, who's battling for second and third place, because he's already guaranteed the victory, right? So there's uproar amongst the community, this guy's the villain of, of Guild Wars 2. He ended up not winning. In fact, their team came in third place. Um, and then later that night, when we went to the team uh, uh, victory dinner, we took them all out and had beers and stuff like that, he decided, because he, he's very competitive, that he wanted to take, out, uh, wanted to take on somebody from the, the, the winning team. So the team abjured uh, from North America actually won the WTS in Cologne. Uh, they have uh, one of the guys on the team, his name, he goes by Noss. Noss and Helseth, after four or five colches, decided that they would arm wrestle to really settle who the most competitive uh, person was. <laughs> So Helseth uh, sits down with Nas, breaks out right hand, and takes him out. And Helseth saying, basically, again, proclaiming that he's victorious. Um, but then that wasn't enough. He wanted to prove that he could beat him both ways. And so he said, let's go left-handed. And so they went and grabbed arms left-handed, 45 seconds of struggle. And all of a sudden, Helseth's arm goes, Pfft. and he looks at his arm, and he goes, seriously? <laughs> Nas broke his arm. We had to take him to the hospital. We had to get a splint done. He, his, his right here was shattered. And that is the story. That is the content that for weeks now after, uh, after Cologne that our fans are talking about. Uh, another guy, Rom, who you saw on the, on the, on the video, uh, another human story, right? He, he came back after, uh, after Cologne, and they came in second place. He was really distraught because he had won uh, uh, the event in, in Boston. And so he decided he was going to stream for as long as he possibly could to analyze how his team possibly lost and would spend, because we, we streamed for eight hours straight that day, all those matches. He deconstructed every single match to the point where it was 4.30 a.m. in the morning for him and he fell asleep on the stream. And that doubled our viewership because there was a Reddit thread that came on, Rom is now asleep on his stream and people poured into the stream. It jumped us like 10 places on the front page of Twitch. These are the reasons why we do eSports. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. And I think it's all about the people too, right? So uh, you're talking about the personalities here too, and that's also where the parallel comes in with, with sports, right? But how do you feel about, because there's some terms that are mentioned uh, when we're talking about eSports. It's also referred to as competitive gaming, for example. Uh, and you're talking about these people as cyber athletes and so on. So. Uh, do you think that that sports parallel is 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 valid, or would you see the branding, so to speak, of 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 esports moving in a different direction? Oh, there's certainly as much competition and training, probably even more, put in by these professional players than than professional athletes. And no one's going to no one's going to argue that Kobe Bryant isn't going to be able to be a much more athletic uh, 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 person who can dunk and do amazing physical feats. Um, but these people put in hundreds and thousands of hours into their craft and are now getting so sophisticated that they've got team uh, uh, coaches and, and, and programs to, 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 to train them, it's professional facilities where uh, they're, they're working on it together. And Andy, you can talk yeah, a little bit more. In most cases, they, they live together. 
and they train almost 24-7. They have houses, and the, the manager will rent out a house and get sponsorship for the house so that these guys can live and train and do it in a location so that they can actually try to hit as many of the tournaments as possible because I mentioned the, the worldwide nature of it. These guys could be in Cologne one day and then here in you know, Las Vegas the next day and then Taipei the next day you know, competing in these events. So the other interesting thing about that is that... Um, the average length of professional gaming is only like four years because unlike the physical element, they don't have the signed contracts and, and it's difficult to keep going. But, but the difference between a 21-year-old and a 25-year-old from a hand-eye coordination or even an 18-year-old is so much so that people are out of the competitive gaming side of things by the time they're not even 30. Uh, which is interesting. However, many of them have huge long careers. We have a guy on Twitch right now uh, called I Am A Cutie Pie, and he, he's an ex-League of Legends player, and he has a humongous following anytime he comes on and plays. So they can make money in a different way, but it's just interesting to think about what the hand-eye coordination element. So we're going to see, you think you're going to see a lot more stars emerge uh, in, in this field and have a, a similar following to, to a Kobe Bryant or, you know, as you mentioned before? Uh, I think there's no shortage of personalities. Um, you know, as again, Guild Wars 2 is not the biggest esports game, but already from the small community that we've had, we've got stars emerge that have their own followings that become partnered on Twitch and start making a, a real income, not only from the, the, the tournament uh, winnings, but from being celebrities and streaming themselves and becoming brands and icons. So yeah, absolutely. It, it's interesting, there, um, this weekend, the Madison Square Garden tournament is League of Legends, and um, one of the teams, Team Liquid, which is a very popular esports team, um, is actually having a meet and greet at Washington Square Park, and they anticipate somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people coming just to say hi to them before they go compete. Last year, about the same. That's amazing. So before I open it up for questions, I mean, uh, speaking to a room of marketers here, I mean, how do you uh, see this form of, of video programming if you set the, the live uh, component or the event component aside from it? Like, how do you choose to invest in, and why in, in, in esports video programming as compared to, you know, engaging in, in, in any other form of video programming that could be, you know, promoting your game? Yeah, I think that um, uh, Andy hit on it uh, as well, which is th there's a unique um, ability for us to have way more content uh, be live and streamed through all of these individual athletes, if you will, streaming their, their practice, right? Where you don't get that from NFL or uh, hockey or whatever it is. And so from us as a brand, we can always be in front of our consumers. And these guys are influencers, right? The, the best of the best players are sitting there and teaching you one-on-one -on -one and interacting with you, answering your questions on how to be better at the, the passion and, the, and the, the game that you love, where you're never really going to get that from Kobe Bryant. You're never really going to get that from uh, a, a football player. You're just not going to have that same one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. And so the video uh, uh, element of that is, since it's all real-time, uh, it's it's, it's so, so much more compelling because of the interactivity to it. So that's one of the, the, uh, the great things I, I, I like about Twitch and about other streaming services is there's that one-to-one -one relationship with this personality, this person that you, you admire so much that you have the ability to ask questions and have them guide you uh, personally, which is, uh, I think, pretty unique. I great. think en engagement is huge, obviously, that they're doing it and they're staying there for a long period of time. It's not a fleeting, I'm in and I'm out. Um, the average length of time for somebody that spends on Twitch is 90 minutes. So they're spending an awful lot of time. And I'm sure that, you know, engagement is such an important part of your business, Steve, yeah. that, you know, that's an added part. Do we have any questions here? Lori? From a demographic perspective, who's participating? who's watching, and then because of that, what brand categories are coming to you? Because again, I don't see a lot of women circling around this, not that that's a bad thing, or we're coming, but I'm just wondering, you know, as, as a Unilever or a P&G, would we come to you? Um, so can you talk a little bit about what you guys are seeing uh, from, a, from a gender perspective? Uh, you could probably talk more broadly about it since we're, I'm just one brand, but. Yes, so initially, um, from, from Twitch's perspective, initially the, the first person to come were game companies and then Hollywood films trying to meet a male demographic. But now, I mean, we're literally talking to Gatorade and Nike about esports, right? I mean, 
traditional brands that have been in the sports industry for a long time, Under Armour, are wanting to get into the space. Um, it, it's just a, a male millennial play. I mean, it's where they're engaged and where they're, you know, where they can't find them in other places. This is an authentic and pretty much untapped area for them. So in any any brand that's that's in but the we're act. starting to see major brands uh, to your point engage, right? Like Coca Cola and Ford, and even have people who are managing their esports marketing, right? Yeah, you'd be surprised how many people now at, at agencies and at brands have esports the ambassador. And it's usually the 25 year old guy that likes to watch LOL or Dota or Starcraft. I mean, who gets it and understands it and says. Listen, I spend six hours a weekend watching this. You could be hitting me, but you're not. Are, but are women coming in? Are, are We're seeing more, more and more. Um, I would say, you know, it's probably an 80-20 right now. Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit less as far as that's concerned. Although we see uh, the women coming. For, if you go to an event, you'll see a lot more of the female audience there. And it can also depend a little bit by game. I know you probably have a better. Scheme. I mean, our game overall skews about. Uh, about 60, 40, uh, male to women. The PVP component, I will say, is more male, for sure. Um, it's more aggressive, it's more competitive, and so we do see a higher skew of, of males there. It's also a little younger, so our game overall is average age about 34 years old, and then the PVP component is about 24 years old. And, and by game, that can change, too. So, like, first-person shooter, like... Uh Counter-Strike Go or Call of Duty will, will skew very male, where a card game like Hearthstone or something that's a little bit you know, not as aggressive, tends to be a little bit more balanced. Our time is up, but I think we have time for one more question here. Do we have a, the, the mic, please, too? Just a real basic question. Um, so the athletes, are they um, going across sports and across different types of sport, uh, of games? And are there events that combine, like a triathlon, for example? Uh, I would say that uh, not usually. Usually they, they focus on one particular game, but there are teams that will sponsor several uh, uh, groups of individual players that play different games, like Evil Geniuses, as an example, has teams that compete not just in Dota or League of Legends, but have uh, several of them. But usually a, a player to get good enough to win tournaments for real, this kind of cash, they play that game and only that game, right? It's not. It's very rare to have a Bo Jackson, right? Yeah, I, w I would agree. That's that's sort of how it's set up. Is that they're focused in on one particular game, maybe a genre, maybe a MOBA to a MOBA, but not in general a shooter to a shooter. But in gen, in order to get so good at these games, you have to really know every single nuance to the game. All right, that's it for us, I think. But one more question over here. Can we get a mic? Okay. I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat it? Yeah. You just said that this audience is only on Twitch, but with something like the arm-breaking story, how do you then tell that story af after the stream is over? Yeah, uh, maybe I misspoke. Uh, the, so uh, as an example, uh, there were several media involved with that. Uh, although uh, we weren't streaming the arm-breaking incident, uh, that got out and uh, was talked about by another streamer from another uh, game that was on Twitch. But then a Reddit thread popped up about that. That Reddit thread then percolated down to our forums, and then eventually there were memes created that went up onto Facebook of uh, putting Helsis' face on various things that obviously you could come up with your own wild imagination. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a viral activity that, as a marketer, it's a luxury to have because I don't have to create this my, myself. It's, it's the community self-sustaining. It's a community interacting with each other through these personalities and stories. Great. So there's no video available to see. I, there is not a video. <laughs> not that I know of. All right. On that note, thank you so much.